This is a recording for the Club Pat project. My name is Matthew O'Brien. Today is the 25th of July, 2023, and I have here with me Mary White. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, can you just confirm for the recorder that you're happy to take part in the project? I'm very happy to take part, yeah. Brilliant, thank you, Mary. Um, and could you just spell your name for the recorder, please? Uh, M-A-R-Y, Mary, and White with an I, W-H-I-T-E. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so we might just start with um, just your early life and, and background, uh, if that's okay. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your early life, uh, when you were born, where you were born, um, and where you grew up? Yeah, uh, I was born in County Wicklow, and uh, very fortunate to have uh, <clears throat> amazing parents um, who homeschooled us um, after a miserable time at a horrible primary school, which will remain nameless, and uh, which had an effect on my life, actually, because... Um, my parents removed us from school and uh, my mother was a teacher and my father was a teacher uh, in a private preparatory school and my mother was one of the first botanists and zoologists uh, to graduate from UCD so uh, I grew up learning the Latin names of flowers and fungi and clouds and the difference between cumulus clouds and other sort of clouds and I just absorbed it all as a sponge uh, we grew up in the Wicklow Mountains and a, at the age of 13 then I went to boarding school in Waterford and uh, which was a very happy experience and uh, after that then I went to Trinity and uh, <clears throat> had a wonderful time there absolutely wonderful time and met my husband who is a mathematician and a geographer and a soil scientist and um, we married in 1980 and we bought this house in 1980 so we've been here 43 years uh, the house was an absolute wreck and uh, none of these gardens were here. The only things that were here were mature trees. So we've created this small, sustainable place, um, you know, for our family. And, and then the nightmare happened. They were going to have an open cast mine just on that hill behind you. And uh, politics was the last thing on my agenda. Uh, but the number one on my agenda was protecting our new purchase, protecting our home protecting the environment because we're long distance walkers and hikers and we love the mountains and uh, we've spent 43 years here recording biodiversity um, how it's increased and how it has decreased sadly over the years we've recorded the the birds the, the uh, fungi um, you know everything that moves wriggles climbs whatever we've recorded that you know in a very haphazard way just for our own amusement but actually looking back on it now, it's dynamite, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. to see what's happening. Yeah. And, you know, the dates we found things and the dates birds arrived. And this year, for the first time in 43 years, the spotted flycatcher hasn't come to us from Africa, nor has the willow warbler. Now, that to us is tragic, which means that they either starved or were shot on the way. Uh, probably a lack of insects and drought and things like that. Now, we do have black caps from Africa and we do have chiff chaffs. And we do have swallows, swifts, and house martins. Swifts not nesting here, but around here. And we have swallows and house martins nesting here. But those two iconic birds haven't come for the first time. And it's a body blow. You know, why? Well, we know why it's happened. But maybe it's a blip. So it'll be interesting to see do they come next year. But to get back in 1988, we heard that a mining company were interested in mining for Andalusite on the mountain here. And um, I'd never been involved in any campaigns in my life. I didn't know what this was going to lead to. So we got started and uh, I handed out leaflets at the church door saying death sentence for Tom Duff. And of course, my God, the local farmers, you know, were absolutely agitated about this. Anyway, we've got a very good uh, committee going and uh, everybody in this area, there was no trouble getting them motivated. There was no trouble. And there were only one or two people who were looking for the money. But everyone was against it. So to cut a long story short, it took um, four long years of campaigning and we beat them. And it was a very nasty campaign, very nasty campaign. And I wrote a book on it and it sold 9,000 copies. I'll give you a copy of it. And it was how to defeat the multinationals, basically. So uh, I was very proud of that. And uh, anyway, it's out of print now. Uh, and probably quite dated because we didn't have the internet and uh, you know I had to write to Andalusite mines in, in Andalusia in Spain 
Uh, I worked in Spain for a few years, so I could speak the lingo, and I got back all the stuff I was able to translate it. And, um, you know, when you think now, Google, you know, to run a campaign, you can have it up and running in 10 minutes and have a GoFundMe page. None of that happened. It was all slog, slog, slog. So uh, we took out full page ads in the paper. We raised over 100,000. Uh, what was what was the money in 1988? Punts or wherever it was. And um, we had a monthly draw for a car and we got the services of a brilliant geologist from Durham who stayed here with his wife and family for three weeks and mapped the area and discovered that the Andalusite, which is the mineral, was um, <clears throat> flawed and another mineral called storolite was within the rock, which would have been uh, prohibitive to extract that and mine it. So basically, uh, it was a stock market hype. The so we was. Yeah. Oh, we had a massive knees up after it because uh, we went all over the country and we visited mine sites and we vi made a video and we showed this video of how mining companies destroyed the environment and this was going to be no different. So I found my mojo during that campaign. <laughs> so I went on then, I was asked to join the Green Party and I had a young baby at the time. I said, absolutely not. I'm more interested in growing five types of lettuce than I am and that kind of thing. But uh, I was over in England one time visiting relations of my husband's and there was a big campaign about, in Norbury about some motorway which is going very close to Winchester Cathedral. And one of these guys actually ended up appearing in a cameo in East Enders or something. I, I don't have a television, but it was one of those iconic programs. And I looked at this traffic and I looked at this fantastic 11th century cathedral. And I also studied Gothic architecture at Trinity as a sideline. And um, I thought, this is wrong. So I said to my husband, I'm going to join up. Anyway, I topped the pole. <laughs> <laughs> I topped the poll in a rural three-seater, which was unheard of, you know, for the council. And then eventually I got elected to the Doyle and I became a minister. And uh, I wanted to become a minister for Hedros. They had one in 1944 in England, but um, it didn't go down well with that idea. So I became minister for human rights, equality and integration, which was a brilliant, absolutely heartbreaking, but brilliant portfolio to have. Um, so... That was that. And then the Greens all lost their seats. We all lost our seats, all six of us, when we were in government, because uh, you know, we were blamed for the banking crash, we were blamed for the regulator, the smaller parties always lose. And you know, politics just politics. It was an amazing experience. I you know, I spoke at the UN, I spoke all over the world. It was an amazing, you know, from little old Boris. Uh, it's amazing what you can use your vocal cords for. And so we decided to go back to our roots. You know, I'm a botanist and ecologist. So we set up this in 2011, converted the barn and it was ready to go in 2013. So that, this actual building is 10 years old now. And, and could you, because it is an expansive site, could you just ex uh, really describe the site a little bit and what's going to happen? Yeah, well the house is um, 1829, it was a Victorian hunting lodge and then it became a rectory until the early 60s. And then uh, one family was here for 15 years, another seven, and we're here for 43. We've literally put down our roots. So it's a protected structure, so you can't muck around with it, which is good. Uh, each pane of each window in our house is 36 panes, which is you know very unusual. And there are very interesting inscriptions on some of the panes, including in one of the bedrooms, a lovely silhouette done with a diamond ring, side profile. Sydney is a very ugly girl, 1930. Poor Sydney. I'm sure she flourished in later life. <laughs> sure was a brother. <laughs> so uh, it's a lovely old house and uh, we have, you know, big families on both sides of the family. So there's always people staying here and grandchildren now. But uh, we, we've made a big rose garden here. We've made a fruit garden there. We have extensive polytunnel and greenhouse and a big vegetable garden and six acres of oak wood over there and six acres of wild flower meadow there, and we further land up the road. So it's a, it's a lovely, unspoiled, we call it a small, safe, sustainable space, and that's what it is. And we get, um, <clears throat> we do uh, mountain hikes, eco trails, wild foraging workshops, wild fungi workshops. We let out the barn for private events for companies to have think in. So we call them think in, walk out. So they have a think in and then walk out. 
and uh, we do shepherd's huts accommodation. But we only have four shepherd's huts and we only ever will have four shepherd's huts because we don't want to become a big glamping site. We don't want to become a caravan park. And people say, oh, God, you could put 10 more huts up there, Mary. We don't want 10 more huts. We want the grasses and flowers to, f to flourish. And we have a hedgerow there, which is over a thousand years old. It's never been ripped out. And you can date that by a law called Hooper's Law. Some people disagree with it. But Hooper was an academic, I think, in Cambridge. And he reckoned for every 100 metres, if you count the number of species, you multiply it. So we've done that. We think it's over a thousand years old. Where some of my um, more traditional conventional farmers think that field is a total waste of money and that the hedge is a nightmare because it's straggly and it's wonderful. And the biodiversity up there is incredible. You know, you, you've got to learn to look at that and see what's there. And you've got to realise that untidy actually is wealth. So speak to me a little bit more about the biodiversity, maybe on site and in the, the broader area as well. Well, we're very, very lucky um, that we, we live at the foot of the Black Stairs. And, you know, and looking out here now at Tom Duff Hill, which was the site of the proposed mining. And then we have Mount Leinster, which is um, the, the biggest mountain. It's 760 metres high. And then we have Knox, Knock Row. And then we have Blackstairs Mountain. So it's a lovely, soft, gentle row of hills. And uh, our Wexford neighbours are on the other side. And we're on this side. And the farming here is, you know, very sustainable, I would say, because of its commonage. And the great beauty of it is it's unfenced. So I think 17 farmers... Um, have the commonage rights on these mountains, on these, on Tom Dove, and I think Mount Leinster, I might be wrong slightly in the numbers, but you know, because some people die and sell on their rights, the families. And then over on Blackstairs, there's a different number of commonages, but no fencing, and uh, the sheep are up there, and it, it's wonderful. So it's low intensity, and you've got the bilberries or the frockens up there, you've got wonderful butterflies, you've got um, mountain heaths and you've got bog osphodel which is a very nice little wildflower so the biodiversity on the upper slopes the middle slopes and the lower slopes is all different because things like to grow at different levels and uh, birds things like um, merlin and uh, sparrowhawks and kestrels they're they're on tom duff on the higher mountains we have peregrines which are rare and also red kites uh, so the biodiversity is brilliant. It's not heavy intensive agriculture. The farmers, the only thing that get up the nose of the farmers is the dogs. You know, uh, poor dog management by some people from the cities mostly who come and say, oh, this is lovely, it's a lovely wild area. And they let their dogs off and they chase the yos which are in lamb and then they die and the lambs die. So there's been a, there was a few kills on the mountain this year and got new signs up there now. So I'm very supportive of the farmers. They're also involved in, on this commonage in an EU life project. You might know that. And uh, the Blackstairs Farming Project, where they take out bits of bracken, which is invasive, and they fence that off, and they dig it out or whatever. They, maybe they're allowed to you know, kill it with something. I don't know. But it's just a dedicated space. And they try and eradicate that. And then they'll take up the fencing. And hopefully the, the natural grasses and heather will grow back. Uh, there's also a big problem here with <clears throat> a couple of farmers, not the ones involved in the EU Life Project, who burn the mountain at a time when it's illegal to do so. There is no burning from uh, the end of March, 31st of March, until the end of August. And we have these farmers who risk um, firefighters' lives, who um, burn out the birds that are in the ground nesting birds there. And we're down to the curlews, who used to be a great feature up here. There's less than 200 breeding pairs in Ireland now. And uh, some curlews up there who are nesting their eggs for bird. I mean, that is, good. that is actually criminal. And until there's a real price put on the environment and on biodiversity, those guys aren't going to stop. Now, what should happen is they should lose their basic payment, which is what they rely on. Because, you know, they're, they're not well off. Uh, I mean, the average income for a dairy farmer is, I think, 158,000. Average. And, um, you know, so we're making a very small amount of money here. We're a small, sustainable business, and we're very happy with that. But you have to know how much is enough. 
you know, are you, are you going to grow and grow and grow and then, you know, lose the joy of the business? So, you know, I would say to farmers, and a lot of these farmers were, are, you know, good friends of mine and were involved in the mining campaign. And, you know, it took them a sea change to vote for a green, you know, a sea change. But they saw I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a sensible green, but I'm very angry about the farmers who, we've, we've a lake here at the front and we swim in it all year round. And for several months of the year, we can't swim because of irresponsible farmers putting on nitrates, fertilizers and slurry at the wrong time. And you get ghastly muck in that, ghastly. We can't swim in it. And you know, that's what, they have a responsibility to put on the correct amount of nitrate um, and do it at the correct time and not poison my land. You know, I'm, I have a law abiding system. We pay our taxes. The rest are responsible, you know, honest custodians of the land and doing their best. And farming, particularly around here, isn't very uh, well paid at all. It's the big dairy boys, you know, in Tipperary and the fine land. Uh, North Carlow is more intensive with uh, tillage, but not with huge dairy herds. That's, you know, Carlow is the second smallest county in Ireland. Thank God we've got the black steers. They can't wreck it. But in our time here since 1980, there's been the mining campaign. There was a proposal, never came to anything, for a landfill. There was another proposal for a rally school to the Black Stairs. Then there was an application for wind turbines. I'm in favour of wind turbines, but it has to be site specific, not in a special area conservation or national heritage area. So there was an um, unsuitable site there, which meant they would have had to widen the road here, rip out the hedges, and uh, you know for a very small wind farm and uh, it was the wrong site and there was going to be massive you'd be much better building small community uh, wind farms where the locals could have a buy-in and get a, get a bit of money out of it and support the project we need it we have to get more and more in you know aggressive about our climate change goals uh, absolutely, it's, it's fascinating um, to hear all that. And you've answered about three or four questions in one. Good, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to no, because I was going to ask about the threats to you know biodiversity in the area. I think you've, you've covered that off um, really well. Um, you mentioned that you know you've spent time walking in the lands. You've got the eco trails um, business here. Um, give me an idea of where you like to go on those trails. Do you mean future or where we no, like sorry, to walk? Where, where, where we are at the moment. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Um, there'll be no expansion. Uh, well, we walk. We walk um, in the Black Stairs, and uh, there, you know, as I said, there's Tom Duff and there's Mount Leinster and there's Knock Row and there's Black Stairs Mountain, sometimes confusingly called White Mountain, and. Um, so we, you know, we had a good bit of work over the years with the local farmers clearing the natural rights away and putting a little kind of, uh, you know, these kissing gates where you pull one forward and you go through. So protects any sheep or cattle they might have in the lowlands. And it's lovely access with beautiful stone walls growing up through this access to White Mountain, Blackstairs Mountain. Beautiful stone walls with lovely indigenous ferns and uh, things called navelworth, or pennyworth, and I believe toad flax growing in it, you know, very natural. That lane will never be touched, never sprayed, but it's kept open by the walkers now. You know, there's Blackstairs Ramblers, they do, um, uh, they walk here, there's Tullow Mountaineering, there's uh, Caluchthanon Walking Group, you know, so they're, they're very mindful of the uh, environment and all they leave is their footprints. And uh, so it's great to see a couple of those walking clubs up there. Um, so we bring them, we bring people up the green lanes as well as up the mountains because when people enroll or book in for a walk, we've no idea of their fitness levels and people usually exaggerate their capabilities. <laughs> so we have to be subtle about where we bring them. So, you know, the weather is a good indicator. If it's misty and wet and cloud is down and they want to go on a mountain walk, we say, this is not a responsible thing for us to do, but we will bring you on an equally engaging walk for the same amount of time. I know where we can eat our packed lunches and we won't get wet at the foot of a waterfall and you won't miss going up there. And we've never had a grumbly person, but you know, we don't bring them up if it's not safe. And uh, so we're, we're low level guides. I mean, we don't bring people up high because it's irresponsible, um, particularly if we don't know who's turning up. And people who want to go 
higher, faster, longer, harder, they don't come here. Uh, we're doing slow walking and we're using our ears to listen to the birds and the predators and the, you know, the raptors, I should say, and we're sampling and foraging on the way as well as walking. So it, it's, it's a nice, relaxed day. So we go up all the green lanes, you know, uh, Rahim Kyle, Zelikan, um, down by Brook Lodge. These are all names will mean nothing to you, but on the map, uh, go down the back of Mount Leinster, down to Corbett Gap and into Kilbranish Woods. Uh, they're you know, beautiful, mature woods, lovely walking, John's Hill. So the Black Stairs are our playground, and we use that word advisedly because we're walking slowly and we're just looking and hearing and sampling, leaving no trace. Uh, we provide flasks for people so they don't bring plastic bottles. Uh, they, we provide a packed lunch with uh, wax wrappers which we can reuse and everything. So it's very sustainable what we do and we only take small groups. Our max is 20. So if there's 20 going, I take 10, my husband takes 10 and we leave a gap between us and then we meet up with somebody who finds very exciting. You know, I give my husband a yell and say, bet you didn't, look what you missed. <laughs> so the Black Stairs are, uh, it's called Black Stairs Eco Trails. This is Black Stairs Eco Center. Our email is info at Black Stairs Eco Trails. So the Black Stairs for us is a magical place to live. So that's why we're very interested in this project. And of course we were cut off initially because we weren't coastal. You know, because you know, it was only Wexford. We were very aggrieved by that because um, while we are cut off from the sea and uh, we're an inland county, we wanted to be involved in the project because it was exciting to develop uh, sustainable links with our neighbours and friends and people doing similar things, either seaweed foraging or hostels. Or, and the Columban Way now is a big thing in this area. You, know, you probably know about that. It's going to start at the Nine Stones and go down to Michel and eventually be waymarked all the way to northern Italy in Bobbio. So it's going to be a fantastic walk. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned earlier on this one detail I want to pick up on. Um, Blackstairs Mountain, you said it's often mistaken as White Mountain. Yeah. Do you know what the story behind that is? I don't know what the story is, but we, we've got the Ordnance Survey maps there framed. And it's very interesting. I don't know why. It's not named after us, I can tell you that. It goes back a long way. It's Blackstairs Mountains, but the locals always call it White, white Mountain. Mm. I don't know whether it's because there is a lot of white heather there, but that's not the reason. I don't know why it's called that. Okay, so, interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and if I was with you on, on the Eagle Trail um, tours, what might I, and you mentioned birdsong, what might I smell or what, what, what might I see? What, what are the kind of, what are the vistas like? Oh, the vistas are fantastic. On a clear day, you know, from Mount Leinster, you can see the Cumra Mountains. You can see, you can see the Slieve Phalums, uh, all looking, you know, south, south, southwest, that kind of way. Um, and if you're looking east on a clear day, you can see Wales, you know, Wales, which is very useful for this project. Uh, you can see that on a lovely sunny day if there's no cloud or mist and things like that. Um, so, you, you know, the topography of the area, uh, of course, you can see all the Wicklow Mountains as well heading northeast uh, and, and then down to the south of the, can the county and on to Waterford, the Cummer is never that really beautiful, the Sleeve Phalums that way. And um, so, you know, the Black Stairs are iconic in that way that they're not, they're not really high, you know, they're not over a thousand metres, but they're lovely, soft, rolling hills that we have to protect and we have to ensure that um, you know we don't get fencing on the mountain because they've done that in the west of Ireland. You have strips the size of this room and maybe ten times as long, but you can't walk there anymore. You know it's barbed wire, and uh, they've done that because the sheep farmers weren't in agreement. So uh, my my hope is that you know there'll be good synergy, particularly with the EU Life project, with this project with good neighbourly relations with my, my neighbours and ourselves and what they're doing. Um, so from, from the mountain point of view, you know, you have different grasses, you have different sedges, you have reeds, you have streams coming down, you have lovely, you know, when you go up Black, if you go up towards um, Mount Leinster at the top of um, Rahana, you, you get up there, there's a fairy pool there where you can swim, you know, it's absolutely 
I'm not telling you where it is, but you can swim there. It's ice cold and you can go plunge in there and you can go up there. And you, it's a very difficult way. We don't bring people up there because it's too hard. Um, we, we bring them off other tracks, but you can walk up there and you can lie on the heather. And, you know, and one day we we're lying in the heather there last autumn and, you know, I opened my eyes and I just looked up and there were two red kites there, just quite low with their forked tails, you know. Look, we got out alive. <laughs> if they were, uh, what you call vultures, we'd be gone. Um, but it was, uh, it's a magical place and you can smell the cold water, you know, the lovely water tumbling down. And then you've got things like bog asphodel and you've got lovely sedges and you've got, um, you, you know, lungworth and you've got milkworth and you've got red dead nettles. You've got all these lovely wildflowers there. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. You don't get poppies or cornflowers up there, but you get a different type of biodiversity. And as you get higher, the flowers drop down, but you get the ground nesting birds, you know, like skylarks and wheat ears, and then you get uh, peregrines, and then you get uh, the red kite. I'm not sure they're nesting, but they're certainly flying over here. I have no proof of their nesting. And you get uh, ring plover, uh, not ring plover, a uh, golden plover in the winter wintering here. They don't breed here, they, they breed in the west of Ireland, but they w overwinter here. Then they go down to uh, the mud flats on the other side of the black stairs and they feed there when the tide is out and with the other waders. And you get skylarks and you get um, you know meadow pipits, rock pipits and rock pipits down at the sea, but meadow pipits up here. Uh, so, you know, as the layers go up, as you go up in meters, different uh, types of biodiversity reveal themselves. Now, if you're walking fast just to get to the top of 760 metres, you're not going to see anything. But I think people are getting more aware of how lucky they are that they can walk there and have a picnic there and uh, just get people to open their eyes and their ears to see the beauty of it. It's not, it's not just about getting to the top. Anyone can get to the top, uh, but it's what you see on the way. Um, and are you, are you familiar with any kind of stories about the plants or animals or the habitats? Are there any kind of local stories or stories indeed within the Black Stairs about particular species? Or um, no, I think I think it's you know poor in that regard. I used to love when I was canvassing, and I'd go into you know what we would call, they would call themselves Lone Rangers. You know, these were guys with open fires and they'd have their food in plastic bags hanging from nails in the ceiling so the rats and the mice wouldn't get them. No heating, no sanitation. And they call themselves Lone Rangers. And they'd be telling me great stories about the rocks up there and um, the dolmens and uh, the king's chair. And, you know, do you know that now up there? And, uh, you know, go with these guys. Uh, you know, they're wearing big long coats, you know, big strings around the middle, no buttons on them. And uh, they were fantastic about the knowledge of, you know, who lived there. And uh, quite good amateur geologists that they knew that these rocks and these stone circles, a lot of stone circles and stones with peculiar writing, you know, rings on them, hieroglyphics and things like that. They were good at that, but they, they weren't that good at the biodiversity. They, you know, they weren't saying now, you know, you'll find a peregrine up there. Yeah, they'd always say, well, you'll be looking for those, won't you? You know, they, they knew I was interested in that. But there wasn't much interest, um, except for Evelyn Booth, who lived on the other side down in Kilbranish, who wrote uh, the, the Flora of Carlow. And she was an amazing woman. She lived in a house called Lucy's Wood, which is still down there. And she, you know, there are cranberries growing here. I know where to find them. And, uh, you know, at Christmas, I go and pick my cranberries. Now, they're not like these big American ones, you know, they're minute. Uh, but my God, are they delicious, absolutely delicious. And that's in an open kind of wet bog place. But I haven't met um, a farmer or, you know, a local who wasn't a farmer saying, Do you know, there's cranberries there. I think they might have just called them berries. So, you know, they're, they're delicious to have that. But it's Evelyn Booth's book, which, um, you know, tells all the... Um, about the bed straws and the different types of heath. There's a, you know, several good heaths there. But the, there's a very good book, you probably have it, um, from the department on the SAC of the Blackstairs, which gives all the, gives all the um, rare plants. Have you got that? 
I'm sure we do. I'm sure you do, yeah. Because that would give you all the, the rare plants that I'm telling you about and ones I haven't told you about um, uh, in that SAC, which is very good for your study. The one thing I'm, I'm very interested about is, you mentioned the cranberries. Um, could you tell me a little bit about foraging in the area? Do you participate in it? Oh, yeah, I lead the foraging walks with my husband. Um, we can find, on our small bit of land here, 25 acres, we can find 40 wild safe foods in 30 minutes. And we've done that for television, and we've done it for a programme called Lords and Ladles, and uh, we took part in a mad TV thing last year uh, called The Farmer Wants a Wife. Have you seen that thing? And this was the Danish version and a Danish farmer and a Danish woman were put together here, out there. See how they get on, foraging. <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. But uh, we did it and we got well paid for it, which is nice. So I don't know whatever happened. But um, <clears throat> we, uh, so that's what we can do here. And um, particularly as you come into the autumn now, because you've got the berries, the nuts, the seeds, the fungi. And uh, I don't know whether you're interested in fungi, but uh, you might like uh, porcini or seps. Uh, well, we've got a strip of land here and we call it Sep City because I could collect maybe 30 seps in five minutes, which is amazing. Yeah. And we've been asked to supply, um, you know, artisan chocolate makers. There's a very interesting plant called Alexander's, which was found, named after Alexander the Great. And it was brought over to Ireland, you know, in the top, in the boots of you know, soldiers and they empty out something irritating their foot and they empty out the boot and the seed would be in it and it came like that. And it's always around old monasteries and churches and uh, we have it growing here. But you can eat the emerging sheets from the stalk which comes into the umbel or the head of it uh, and it's known as the poor man's asparagus, absolutely delicious. So we would cook that up and it's absolutely luminous green and fabulous. And then in winter, the seed heads, uh, you can use that for pepper. And we would use it here for breakfast and things like that in the autumn. We dry it and guests have it on their poached eggs, which is very, very nice. But, um, you know, chocolate, chocolate makers are very interested in these flavours and they wanted us to supply them. But we don't supply because you're taking everything. You know, they would, might want five kilograms of seed. Uh, that would take us hours to, you know, find, dry, deliver. And that, uh, we're not interested in that commercial aspect. Our, our interest is to enthuse people about the plants so that in their own area, their own patch, their own mountains, their own equivalent of the black stairs, that they can say, oh, there's Alexander's, I'll take a few seeds and dry them. And, uh, you know, put them into a pepper mill and absolutely delicious and uh, one one a couple of years ago we had it was a prolific mushroom season i mean too many for us and it was before i had a hydrator i have one now and i would dry the mushrooms and keep them over the year which is fantastic and then reconstitute them for stews and curries and things perfect and uh, so we have that but uh, so what am i going to do with these i didn't want them wasted so i brought them into a high-end restaurant and I said, would you like those? And uh, he said, I would, yeah, I'll give you 20 euro. I said, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I wouldn't be a graspy money person. But there is actually, um, on the stock market, uh, a price list for fresh mushrooms. And I said, do you know, because I checked this morning, that the price for a kilo of porcini or seps is 42 euros a kilo. And you're offering me 20 euros for four and a half kilos. And I've spent a lot of time gathering these. I said, I'm not looking for, you know, top dollar, but, you know, you're, you're really pulling my leg with this one. Oh, he said, I'll give you dough. And I said, no, I'm not interested. I'll give him, I, I just gave him to the local hotel. But, you know, that's, you know, so we're not into commercial foraging. And we've been asked to do it hundreds and hundreds of times. You know, could you give me a basket of mushrooms? Could you give me Alexander seeds? Or Now, we're doing an interesting project next Wednesday week were involved in a project in Shankill Castle which is in Paulstown for the Carlo Garden Festival and we're foraging for a couple of hours and then a guy is going to cook up for 70 people uh, a wild forage supper with what we find. Now I will actually give him the stuff the day before because there's no way he's going to have time to prepare that so that'll be lovely we probably have um, 
a wild sorrel butter and maybe nettle soup and some nice sourdough bread and then a frittata with you know ground ivy and um, various interesting things in that with you know peppers and things and from an organic vegetable garden and then plum crumble with something uh, probably rose petal syrup so that'll be lovely and uh, but that's not um, you know that's all just gathered there and we'll do that we're not selling that and it's a good idea to promote for people to say god what is sorrel butter and uh, so it, that'll be a nice we just do that once a year L- the last couple of years couldn't do it because of covid but this year we're doing it and uh, he's a very good baker and chef and stuff like that uh, we do a lot with michelin star chefs uh, we've been invited down to mount juliet and to ballyfin house hotel and we were the foragers there and there were nine michelin star chefs and they cooked up this amazing lunch with everything that I was helping them find in this 700 acre estate. <clears throat> no fertilizers or anything like that, on absolutely pristine. And they cooked up this lunch. God, it was unbelievable. You know, nine different courses, nine different wines. We were driving, couldn't taste any of them. But the lunch was amazing. And the chefs are looking for the flavors. Now, the Alexander's is different to ordinary pepper, they're interested in that. Uh, sorrel is fantastic with fish every bit of fish you get a lump of lemon and they're looking for how to um, kind of design flavors that go with things that's not our forte our forte is knowing the plants and their forte is knowing what to do with the plants once they know what the flavor is so it's they're very interested in you know getting the wild flavors in because obviously it's good for them to have it on the menu but the, but the local the local hotel when um, I gave them Porcini, they you know they credited me you know the Porcini were brought into us by Mary White of Black Stairs Ecotrays so that was very nice and generous that's all I want really but we don't do that that was only an exceptional year and obviously you have an uh, interest in foraging is there a broader community of foragers within the Black Stairs no not that I know of but you know I'm linked in with um uh, you know, on, on Facebook and Instagram with a lot of foragers, you know, both here and in, in England. And for a couple of years, we ran a wild food summer school. We did that for three years, I think. And we had three days of amazing talks on hedgerows, fungi, foraging. And we had Catherine Fulvio down from Ballynockan and we had this amazing guy. We had him over, Miles Irving, and uh, he's just been taking part in a study of only eating wild food for a month and um, with some other foragers that I know in Ireland. Now, there's no illustrations in that book, but it's absolute dynamite. And so he came over and it was fascinating, you know, what he was telling us we could eat and everything like that. And we had people from the Biodiversity Data Centre giving talks on hedgerows. We had um, people who were interested in the black stairs and the the plants of the black stairs and uh, the fungi of the black stairs. But it was it was getting bigger and bigger, and we thought we're not going to do it again. You know, cut and run when it's good. So we we stopped doing that, and we just do foraging, a major foraging workshop every month. The next one is August the fifth. And um, we do one a month from March until October, and then we do three or four fungi in October. Then we do um, Celtic tree trails and why the Celts worshipped the seven noble trees, the seven uh, commoners, lower divisions of the woods and bushes of the woods. And they worshipped those trees and bushes for what they gave them for their diet, like, you know, pine nuts from the Scots pine, which is an Irish tree, despite its name, you know, acorn bread, acorn flour, wild crab apples. Uh, they worshipped the holly because it was a very hard wood and they made their chariots out of, out of wood. And the hazelnuts, of course, gave them, um, you know, nuts were a very valuable source of protein in the diet. And the crab apples, they weren't, you know, you couldn't go to Lidl or Aldi and pick up your fruit and your blueberries or your asparagus from Kenya. Yeah, you know, it was all local and they knew their plants and they had to survive. Uh, so, you know, we do that. And then we do, if somebody wants um, a, for, a private foraging event, minimum group not a five, we do that during the week. We do quite a lot of that. And we do a lot with schools. 
Can tell me a little bit more about the schools? The schools are great. Um, schools are absolutely great. They come either at the end of term uh, before they get their summer holidays and we have a few schools who always come in September. Quite a lot of Gael Skullina. And um, I'll tell you an interesting story about a group which we did on the other side of the Blackstairs, down in the Raven, near Curraclough. And we met the school down there. And um, it's a wonderful place because you've got the dunes for different biodiversity and you've got the woods. And the kids were, you know, great. And the teacher had warned me, it was a desh school, uh, you know, disadvantaged. And she said, now there are one or two here now, you know, who don't want to be here and, you know, they'll give you grief. I find you never get grief when you have kids out <laughs> they just love being out of the classroom and you know what's this Mary and oh I don't like that and they spit it out and oh yeah give me more of that bitter stuff I love that sorrel what's it called and you know, they're really interested and we teach them how to measure trees without measuring tapes like the red Indians used to do and we do bug hunts and uh, pond hunts and you know water stuff and so they love all that and uh, then I get them to design a school badge with something from biodiversity and they love that, you know, it'd be amazing what one guy does, designed a badge with worms. I said, why are you doing the worms? And, you know, worms are great, but why do you? I love worms. You know, it was amazing. But the story, which re will remain, and I've said it at many conferences, so yeah, I, I, I do a lot of talks and webinars and, you know, around the place. And um, this guy, he had outgrown his strength and he was a big boy for sixth class and very tall, overweight, you know, everything going wrong, um, disturbed family background and uh, never said a word, never said a word. And uh, all the kids scrambled onto the bus then and uh, the teacher said, does anyone want to ask Mary? And they didn't because we'd been talking all day. This guy put up this huge hand and uh, the teacher was gobsmacked and he just, with his thumb said, how can I be her? which was me. And that boy now is a wildlife ranger in Toronto. It wasn't amazing. He could have mitched that day. He mitched a lot of days. You know, dysfunctional family. He went to the library. He got the books out. He got his degree. He did work experience here. He went to Tralee IT and now he's in Canada. I think he's in Vancouver now. You know, he was working with raptors. He suddenly realised, you know, I don't have to do boring German or English or physics, you know. I, how can I be her? God, it was such an emotional moment. And I kept in touch with them, and I'm still in touch with them. Brilliant. Well, that's great to hear. You know, that's, that. you know if, you, if you can make the connection, even one out of 60 kids, you know, we'd have four or five people with us on those big days. But if you can make the connection with even one, and what a connection, you know, how can I be her? You know, and his whole life changed. So I'm curious, biodiversity aside, um, what are the other kind of important aspects of the local natural heritage in the Blackstairs Mountains? Well, well, it's the um, the stories of families who were reared there. You know, there's um, a little house halfway up the Blackstairs. You you wouldn't know how to get to it, but you know, I know how to get to it. Little old house and. Uh, there are just three scrubby trees around it. And a huge family came out of that. It was a harness maker. Think of it now. And uh, people talk about that man. He had a big family. And um, how he loved the Black Stairs, a little stream rolling by there. Um, so his name would come up quite a lot about somebody, you know, who loved being there, who was proud of his, proud of place, really. And um, so he was one, and there was another very nice man, uh, I won't mention his name, but uh, I used to help him fill in a few old forms, you know, for the Department of Agriculture. They're all terrified of the Department of Agriculture, if you get anything wrong, you know, you don't get your payment, and uh, sometimes it can be a bit harsh, you know. Some of these guys that were getting on, and you know, their eyesight wasn't good, and didn't bother going to get glasses, and they couldn't see the form, and you know, well, I'd fill it in. And I always made sure, you know, I yeah, brought a magnifying glass with me, so I said, now, you, you, you know what I'm going to do here, and I'm going to fill it in. I, are you happy with it? Yeah, because I must be blamed. <laughs> and they're very complicated forms. But he, he was a sheep farmer uh, on the commonage there, and he loved his place and loved going up the black stairs. And uh, 
he'd say to me, you know, you know those birds with the, the white, he didn't say rump, he didn't know that, they're back. And I said, oh yeah, the wheat ears. And he said, I said, you know, they come from South Africa. He said, I know they come from Africa. And he said, I know where their nests are. You know, that, you know he, he walked the mountain, he knew it. I like talking to those people about um, their heritage and their pride of place. And politics gives you a great, I could go into any house. I might be kicked out, some of them. I might be welcome with cups of tea and, as they say, cuts of bread. And uh, sometimes you're like a parish priest, you drink more cups of tea in a day that you just can't drink any more cups of tea. But meeting these, uh, you know, old guys particularly, and uh, then I'd meet somebody, um, which was, you know, quite alarming really, um, some of the wives and uh, the man of the house, always called that, man of the house would be out with the sheep or a few cattle. And she said, you know, I'd vote for you. She said, but I can't tell himself, can't tell himself. You know, because they would be traditional, maybe Fianna Fáil or um, Labour or Fine Gael. He said, but I'm voting for you, but I can't tell himself. So I said, well, just keep that vote green. <laughs> that might have changed over the last 10 years. But mostly the, the people living around, you know, the black stairs, which, are, you know, they were, they were single or, you know, widowed. And... Uh, you know, get a great connection with them because they have plenty of time. Time is the great thing. So it's nice to hear about stories. And then, of course, up Shannon's Lane, you know, where they, the bomb was dropped. Uh, do you know about that? Tell me a little more. That, that was amazing. If you go up Shannon's Lane, <clears throat> Shannon's Lane brings you on to Knock Row Mountain, where the giant's chair is, a dolmen. And it's, it's the most fantastic lane for butterflies. Absolutely. Silver wash for Tillery's green grain fertilities, you know, holly blues, you name it. It's, it's on a hot summer day, heaven. It's just a narrow lane, just wide enough for maybe a quad or a small tractor, but they don't go up there. And uh, lovely stone walls, you know, beautifully made and wonderful ferns and things like that. And spleen warts coming out of the stones, really magical. But um, Shannon's Lane, friends, friends of ours now actually bought it but I think it was bombed in 1942. Uh, German bombers, they just dropped the bombs indiscriminately. And I think three people were killed, uh, two brothers and a sister. They all lived there. And I know the relation of one of them now, Martin Shannon, who's chairman of the Black Stairs Project. I was talking to you about the EU Life Project. Um, so that was, there's a plaque there now and they've, um, these friends of ours live there and they homeschool their kids and the kids are all doing things now. They're all past school age. But um, that leads you straight on to, you know, you can get up to the back of Mount Leinster there. Really beautiful, where they used to cut the turf and everything. The path goes right up, the lane goes up right to Mount Leinster, left to Knock Row Mountain, which is lovely. There's a cross on the, on the mountain there, which is put up in, I think, 52, the, the holy year. And, you, you know, from the road, it looks quite a small cross. When you get up there, it's massive. So the, the biodiversity there and that interesting um, historical uh, aspect of that's very sad. Uh, you know, they had a memorial there recently of so many years, probably 2022, 42. Uh, and uh, there's, a sh there's a sign now saying Shannon's Lane. There used to be any sign up there. But it's a magical lane for biodiversity. You know, the mosses. Um, the grasses, the butterflies in particular, and uh, some interesting, you know, dung beetles and things like that, and ladybirds up there. We went up to Tom Duff one day, or my husband did actually, and I wasn't with him, and he went up there. He was doing, looking for something, and uh, as you do, he went up there, and the whole top of the mountain was crawling millions of ladybirds. And we were having a problem with white fly in our tunnel. And it came back down. Uh, you're, you're not talking five minutes here now. You know, he had to come down, then climb up the mountain. He went up with a bucket with the lid on it. And he took um, a couple of hundred uh, ladybirds down and put them in the tunnel. We've never had a problem with white fly since. <laughs> natural solution. <laughs> a natural solution, natural predators. I'm curious as well, just in terms of the community in which you're, you're living here, um, how much would you consider yourself as well to be from the Black Stairs Mountains? Because um, you weren't born in the area, but you've come to the area. Oh, I'm sure I'm called a blow-in still, even though I'm here nearly, you know, going on 50 years. Um, but 
uh, I'm very involved in the community. I'm very involved in the community. And of course, the mining, you know, embedded me totally because they were all, nobody wanted to lose their farm. Nobody wanted to lose their basic payment. Nobody wanted to see the mountain removal. We're talking about open cast here. We're not talking about underground. And I used to have a great line and I said, you know, um, I love my neighbours in Michel, I used to say at the meetings, but I don't want to wave at them every day. I want the mountain in between us and they want the mountain in between me. <laughs> because they love the mountain too. And they're building a sustainable tourism there and there's going to be hostels and everything there for the Columban Way pilgrims and everything. And a guy the other day dropped over leaflets and things. So I've been, you know, I'm involved in the Rohana community group. I'm involved in the cleanups and the Leave No Trace. We're trainers for Leave No Trace. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we do the litter picks. Um, uh, the ICA come here for foraging groups. And uh, there's very young, dynamic people now moving into these organisations. It's not, you know, uh, you know, just older people hanging on. I mean that nicely. Um, but younger people have moved in and married the sons of farmers and uh, they're fantastic people. So I'll be involved with the ICA in terms that they would come here and I support them and um, involved with the Rohana community group and the litter picks. I'm a reader in the local church, reading on Sunday, I mustn't forget. Um, and um, very embedded in, you know, uh, there's a, a link to... Uh, we have this thing on our phone, security alert of you know people dumping and things like that. So very very involved in anything that goes on in the community, and would be asked to speak at various things. And I was involved in a project with a Dutch artist about our community and um, you know why we came to live here, and you know are we considered blow-ins or are we part of the community? I'd say, I'd say we're well in the community. Yeah, I don't think we're you know somebody might have a go and say, well of course you weren't born here. And I said, you've got to follow your heart. You can't actually say, I want to marry somebody from Wicklow. <laughs> so I'd say I'd be, I would be extremely well known here. And of course, I would have rubbed up a lot of feathers the wrong way being a green. Um, uh, Dr. Claire McGing, who specialises in gender studies in Maynooth, and uh, I spoke down there a few times, she informed me that I was the first Green Party member to be elected in Western Europe from a rural community. Most Greens in uh, Germany and Luxembourg and France, Spain, they're from urban areas. And I'm from the, the heart of the Blackstairs. And we had a Green councillor, Dan Boyle, who was a TD and lost his seat and became a senator and he's a councillor now. And he's a long time you know, political activist. And we had a party here when I got elected. It was amazing. I got elected. And they all said, you'll never get elected. Dinosaurs here of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. You'll never get in. But I did get in. And um, I had a party here. And he drove up from Cork City. And he said, he got her. He said, he said Jesus Christ, I don't know how you got elected. You know, it was so rural. <laughs> so, I know, I would, th I would um, yeah, I consider myself, you know, deeply rooted. For instance... Whoever is polluting our lovely lake, which we swim in, uh, I asked a local farmer, uh, could he give me a bale of straw? And I'd put it at the mouth of a small tributary river here, because that's what Chagas say you should do, put it there to catch the effluent, things like that. And, oh yeah, he said, I've been advised to do that. He was having trouble on his farm to put a few bales of straw and things like that. And I said to him, now Bertie, what do I owe you? And he said, nothing for what you've done to the community. You know, and I said, Bertie, have the tenor here so you know he, he wouldn't take any money so you know I'd have a, have a good relationship with farmers another farm we this is a late cut meadow under the Department of Agriculture scheme it's a REAP scheme it's a, a um, rural based scheme you know for the number of wildflowers you have and actually the agriculture instructor had to come out here to find the name of the flowers they didn't know it we had the most of it before he went around to the other farm tragic but anyway uh, so you can't cut that until uh, mid-August. And I ask uh, a really good farmer friend of mine, um, will he cut it? And he, do, he will. And he takes all the bales, for, you know, he gets about 35 round bales, which is quite a lot. And I give them to him for nothing. 
and uh, and he said if you ever want a tractor or anything so when we got the huts we got two huts in and then we got another two I said Seamus would you be able to drag the huts into position no problem no payment and then I want an old bath removed into a trailer an old bath there huge big metal bath and uh, oh yeah he said I'll lift that in for you any time so it's a great synergy you know it's working together he's appreciative of taking all that hay off and for the winter he's only a small suckler cowherd man and he's a good bit of sheep and uh, so anything I want in terms of machinery I just say same as would you be and I don't drink him very often you know, maybe less than once a year and he'd just I'd tell him shame as you can cut it now whenever you want and we've got 25 solar panels there. I said, you know, don't mow down my solar panels. <laughs> but he, they're delightful. They're four brothers who never married. You know, they're, you know, they would tell you a lot of stories about the Black Stairs. They live in the Black Stairs and they're the nicest guys you could imagine. So you describe the Black Stairs as a very welcoming place. Oh, yeah. It's, um, to me, the, living in the Black Stairs, I always say I live at the foot of the Black Stairs. And some farmers say, you don't. I said... Ten minutes, I'm on Tom Duff. I said, you know, you live down there and you say you love the Black Stairs. I love the Black Stairs. I've named my business after the Black Stairs. I walk in the Black Stairs. I go up there when I want to clear my head of the Black Stairs. I'm making a small amount of money from our business, the Black Stairs. Our email is the Black Stairs. Everything to do with the Black Stairs. I love the Black Stairs. They're they're in my DNA because they're so lovely, so unspoiled. And we want to be able to work with the Wexford people, which we do. I opened the Kiltili Blackstairs Walk a few years ago, which is a fantastic walk uh, from the Kiltili side. And I opened that and I said, it's so great for you to do this and wonderful signage. You can walk that in any weather because the signage is so clear, so good using Blackstairs granite. And they have a red arrow on it. I mean, you really would want to be dense to lose your way up there it's brilliant and so we would walk that regularly if the weather was bad you know it takes about two and a half hours a wonderful walk high level walking see down to Ross Lair you can't see whales from there but uh, you can see the Irish sea twinkling away because we love the sea because we're landlocked you know when we see seagulls flying over we say oh god I know where you come from because I'm a sea person Uh, the only thing I miss in life is daily sea swimming and I was brought up by the sea. My father was a great sailor and yachtsman. He was in the Navy. Uh, so, you know, so I love the sea. I love the smell of the sea. I love going down there when it's a dreadful day and the wind and the rain and howling and get into the sea and have your mug of coffee afterwards. You know, nothing like it. But then you come home to the Black Stairs. You know, it's a, it's a lovely climate. It's a lovely small county. And, and, and living in South Carlow, where the Black Stairs are, no comparison to North Carlow, which is quite industrialised um, agriculture, and you're getting near uh, Kildare, which is commuter country. So, you know, we love, we want to protect the Black Stairs, want to protect the biodiversity, protect the mountains from inappropriate development, um, and make sure that, you know, this community appreciates what they have, which I think they have in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. There's a huge awareness now of how important it is think of roads and Corfu now and they're not saying Crete has got to be careful and are there many community events or celebrations that take place throughout the year oh yeah yeah um we'll have now um the black stairs farming project they'll have a great she- the great day of all the project and they'll have the sheep down and sheep dog trials in rahana is absolutely fantastic it's jammers as they say here it's really great <clears throat> lovely to see the sheep and everything like that and <clears throat> community hall gives out teas and things like that um, the Rahana drama group is a tremendous local drama group they're very good they just finished their their plays there's the Blackstairs uh, children's theatre group which is run by a friend of mine uh, Leone uh, Lloyd who lives in the Shannon's house which they rebuilt not rebuilt but refurbished uh, where the bombs were dropped uh, so there's something going on then there's you know litter picks as I say and there's uh, a women's group uh, and there's the pub has reopened here you know in Rahana which is great the local pub and he runs uh, the storehouse too which is a hostel dormitory type type accommodation and uh, so there's there's something going on well the Blackstairs thing is a big one the play is a very big one uh, when we have our litter picks there's tea afterwards in the hall 
and uh, <clears throat> somebody said to me, you know, going to the going to the local church. And he said, I'm not sure anybody in this church believes, but it's a place where we meet and we get the news. Don't tell that to Father Rory. <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, have there been? You've been here for 43 years. Have there been changes in the ways of local life in that time? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean. <clears throat> There's far more cars on the road. Uh, there's far more people commuting out of here. Um, you've only got to go to the junction of the M9 motorway to see all the cars parked off, which is ca- carpooling, which is brilliant. There might be 10 or 20 cars there. People drop their cars there and they share a lift up to Dublin, which is really good. Um, there's a lot more young people who I'd say are, uh, you know, this is probably a general statement. Some of them I don't know. Um, Quite a lot of them I don't know. I'm not sure how interested they are in the biodiversity. I wish the planners would have more sustainable planning in terms of the housing that they're building. It should be long and low, not these two-storey, you know, mock Georgian things. Um, you know, I'd be, yeah, you know, that worries me that they, they should be doing that. They should be allowing more wooden houses. Those are two wooden houses going up quite close, which is brilliant. You know, everyone has a septic tank. Everyone, has, you know, waste water. These houses are sticking out like sore thumbs. They shouldn't be status symbols. They should be houses that are allowed to be built for the future of what is coming down the track in terms of wetter, wetter, warmer summers and uh, greater storms. That's what, that's what should happen. I was a very strong critic of the housing policy on the local council. I was very unpopular, very strong on biodiversity. You know, and, you know it was a very difficult time uh, it wasn't for me, but it was um, difficult in getting your views across. There were only three women on the council, you know, 19 men, a lot with very archaic ideas and, you know, anti-green, anti-green, and still some of them anti-green about planning. You know, they would be lobbying for these huge trophy-type houses. Look out that window there now. Just look out there. You see that house on the top of a hill? See the house? mock Georgian, top of a hill. And those people often say to me, God, it's terribly windy, we can't grow anything. And I said, of course it's windy. You're built in the wrong place. I didn't say that to them. I said, well, it's very difficult to grow things on top of a hill. You know, cause sometimes people ask me to plan their gardens. And they'd only ask me to plan their houses. <laughs> so they're the things that uh, I see locally. You know, we shouldn't have bigger houses. Now, we bought a derelict house, so people can't point the finger at us. It was on the market for four or five years and was in desperate nick when we bought it. But we both come from old houses and we weren't phased by buckets on the landing and slates flying off and fabric wires to the electricity and flames shooting out of them. I kid you not. Uh, so over the years, we've, you know, we've done it up and spent a lot of money preserving a heritage structure. So... We were never going to build a trophy house in the, in the middle of a field and buy an SUV. Never. Uh, and I'm also curious, just given the um, site here and the old home, from an archaeological perspective, has there anything ever been found on the site or is there anything of significance either on this site or in the broader? Well, the Carlo Archaeological Infantry, which I have, uh, you know, gives all the standing stones, gives all the circle of stones, and gives all the stones that are subscribed in the Fulloch Fias and everything like that. Um, uh, up Shannon's Lane, there's a very interesting um, stone, stones there with carvings on them. And I gave a little talk one time for a group of wood turners. There's a guy called Glenn Lucas, who's an amazing wood turner. And he's you know, he's got his tribe all around the world and during COVID he was doing online courses and he supplies tools and things, amazing things and special aprons and he has a wonderful workshop now where turners come and some of them stay here, which is very nice. And um, um, but not in this immediate area. This house is a protected structure. Mount Leinster Lodge is a protected structure. Boris House is a protected structure. Huntington Castle is a protected structure. Lisnava in Tullow is a Rathvili is a protected structure, and um, the sad thing is a lot of stuff was bulldozed out of you know when farmers were making and, and, and you know forty fifty years ago when they wanted to make bigger fields, and mercifully they pushed all the lovely granite boulders and things to make 
particularly up here, you think you're in Connemara on parts of Mount Leinster, the lovely stone walls. Um, so I'm sure things were bulldozed out of it, not in a malicious way, but just through clearance. And there's more guidance now on what's happening. But um, the main thing is not to grub out the, the hedges and uh, burn the mountain at the inappropriate time and uh, quite honestly build these unsustainable houses around the place, you know, which are eyesores. So then people say to me, oh, it's well for you living in a big house. And I said, uh, I said, you could have bought that house. I said, it was on the market for 15 years before we approached it. And it was getting into disrepair. You could have bought it. And um, why didn't you? You know, you built a brand new house. And some of the people, I would say, totally unsustainable. And, and look at what you built. Because then they come when you're a politician and say, can't afford to heat it. You know, and then they want, you know, they build a house in the country and then they come to you when I was a politician and say, there's no footpaths, Mary, and there's no lights. I said, you don't have lights and footpaths outside the town boundaries, you know. And, and then one woman came to me and said, terrible smells from cows and slurry. I said, that's part of living in the country. No footpaths, no lights, and you put up with the smells. If it's affecting your water, then you have a right to gripe. That's the other side of me. <laughs> I, I'm curious as well, just given that you um, uh, are involved with tourism in, in the area, um, how would you describe the kind of general sense of tourism in the Baxter Mains? Well, you know, I'm involved a lot with, um, <clears throat> we're a gold accredited ecotourism place here. And uh, we haven't been, uh, we have to do the accreditation again because it's all put back over COVID. But for the last 12 years, we've won gold, which is very hard to get because it's under the, you know, the Tourism Sustainable Council criteria. It's an absolute nightmare. You know, it takes about over two months to do the application. Then you have an audit, you know, for a whole day. Nightmare. Nightmare. But, it, you know, it's worth it. But it's been taken over now by Sustainable Travel Ireland, which I, I'm not sure they're going the right way. But Tourism Ireland are, um, or Fort Ireland are becoming more and more aware of how important slow travel is, how important sustainable travel is, how important is what we're doing here, uh, ecotourism. And that's what it is. Uh, so uh, I'm very involved in seeing where that goes. And a Green Party colleague of mine is Minister for Tourism and I'm always trying to you know, push her to you know, get a designation we're registered here with Fort Ireland for um, welcome standard, which is for huts and glamping and yurts and things like that. And, uh, you know, we have very good facilities there in terms of bathrooms. And they came this year and we passed everything and said, my God, I've never seen cleaner grout. And I was so amazed. But sometimes you know, if grout is dirty, it looks terrible. You know, it looks terrible. So we're very fussy about grout and, um, you know, keeping it sustainable. But so I think tourism, um, Fort Ireland, uh, they're really working on improving the brand. We get people from Ross Lair, which is just over an hour away, and they come here for their first night, and they do Ireland in eight days, and they stay here on the last night. That's not on. Then we get people from Switzerland who stay here for a fortnight and never move out on their bikes. They ne but they just go and get food. We had another Canadian girl who was here for two weeks and I was on her own. She had no car or anything. And I said to her, now, would you like to come shopping with me? And she said, no, I couldn't be bothered. She said, would I give you a list? The list was chocolate and wine most of the time and a bit of pasta. <laughs> but she didn't want to move out. She had a hectic life. And we had people on, I can't remember, you know, it was the 200th floor of some ghastly building in New York. And they came here, you know, chill out in New York. They got lost from the car to car in the park up in the airport and they ended up in the IKEA in Ballymun. And they couldn't get out of it. First time driving on the other side of the road. Eventually they got here and late at night I showed them their hut. Two and three in the morning and the afternoon I said to Robert, they're dead. Suicide pact. <laughs> and they got up eventually and they said it was the first night that they never heard anything. No homicide calls, no fire brigades, even though triple glazing, no helicopters going over, no planes going to JFK. They, said they couldn't believe 
flavor. The quiet. This is a great place too for um, dark skies. There's no air pollu There's no um, light pollution here, and we get the Carlo Astronomy Club. They come here t sometimes, you know, with their big telescopes, and you know they they come at nine and spend the night here, you know, stargazing, which is great. So I think I think Fort Ireland keeps the point. I think they're very aware that, you know, sustainable tourism it has to be like. We can't be racing around the country and being one of the two million going to cliffs the mower and clicking away. Why are you clicking the ruddy photographs? You know, it's, it's in your head. And if I was to ask you what sites or trails or locations that you think tourists would visit most in the Black Stairs, what might they be? Oh, the mountains. Yeah, we have the Barrow as well, which I haven't mentioned. You know, it's the, the longest river outside the um, Shannons, 119 miles long from where it rises in the sleeve blooms and Carlo has a tremendous section of it and also too it has a, a linear grass track which is fantastic which I campaigned against having a hard surface and concreting oh fall to Ireland and anyway, we won that battle for the moment and we'll probably try again but the black stairs are you know um, there is um, micro lighting there is paragliding there is hang gliding there's walkers three or four walking groups on this side of the black stairs more on the wexford side it is a complete and utter gem but it's got to be protected from unsustainable development and proper planning and sustainable development for the black stairs somebody has got to be you know a watchdog uh, we've been watchdogs for 43 years but there has to be other people coming up who are as interested in us and as um you know Aggressive is the wrong word, but you know, as passionate about that, you know, I spend my time looking at planning applications to make sure that nothing awful is going up there, you know. And there's more mining prospecting license in Michel, you know, for lithium. And the great thing is, oh, we need lithium, Mary. You drive an electric car, and you want those poor children of nine in the Democratic Republic of Congo to be going down there on no wages or minimum wages. Uh, yeah, are you happy with that? Do you want it up there? So I, I, my thing is, it's site specific. Why do we have a designation of the Black Stairs of a national heritage area and special area of conservation if we're going to allow unsustainable development and wreck the Black Stairs? So it's not nimbyism. It's a balance of what the government and the local authority want for the area. Carlo Tourism, Carlo County Council are spending hundreds of thousands promoting the Black Stairs. And when I asked the CEO of Carlo Tourism, was she against the hard surface of the Barrow track? I didn't get an answer and I resigned. I resigned from Carlo Tourism and everyone says, you're going to suffer. I don't know whether I suffered or not, but I got a lot of kudos by saying, this is the wrong option. We had people staying here and I found out that they were the ecologists for Waterways Ireland and the planning application. For the, see what the biodiversity was and I said how did you get on? I was so fascinated when I heard this. I said how did you get on? Oh there's no kingfishers and there's no otters. I showed them the photographs. I said there is. I know where all the holes are of the otters. They put down that there were no otters. They hadn't a clue. But we got an ecologist down and photographs of everybody of the you know the trails of the otters, the scat, the holes, the uh, kingfishers they closed their eyes and got the money and do you think or what role I should say do you think that upland communities can play in developing maybe tourism in the area well everyone wants to be supported everyone um, would like maybe if there were some nice grants and things like that to keep it the way we want it uh, the EU Love Project is doing its best um, Department of Agriculture and Chagas, you know, have to up their game. They have to. Up. It's not about production. You know, it's about sustainable or regenerative agriculture. That's what it's about, and there has to be money put into that. That you know, a field which it is. There's the new acre scheme now, and there's gloss schemes, uh, and that's going to pay farmers to have meadowsweet and lungworth and yellow rattle and all these things in their fields. And instead of classifying them as weeds and that is going to bring pollinators pollinators if the pollinators go we're gone 
Because what are we going to do? We can't pollinate by hand the crops. And that's what's happening in China now. They're hand pollinating some of the crops. Uh, if that's what's going to happen here, you know, for our wheat and our oats and our rye and wherever we're growing, you know, in our food crops, you know, the pollinators are key indicators of our survival, our human survival. And that message is getting across. And as farmers say to me, if there's money in going green, Mary, we will do it. So that's where the money has to go. It's a sea change, a mental change. A lot of farmers have got the message. Some haven't, but a lot have. And I'm, you know, not anti-farmer. I'm pro-good regenerative farming. And farmers have realised that they can't pollute our rivers. Uh, and they can't pollute our water. We had, you know, we had our water polluted to red alert here. And somebody said, oh, your animals here. I said, we have no animals. One cat. And then this guy said to me, oh, the starlings could have polluted the well. I said, come on. Are you going to get rid of all the birds? I said, this is runoff. Runoff. And we're paying over 400 euros a year to have our water tested. It would be a great well here. I said, because it was polluted, not, it's not my fault. Yet I'm paying. We put in an ultralight system here now, which costs 1500 which is fantastic. But we had to do it. There were no grants, you know, to protect our business. So we're running uh, this sustainable business here and we're getting huge amount of repeat business. People come back and they love this space because it's different and it's quiet and they can cook in or they can go out. And um, we're not looking for, you know, we're a very small business here. But it enabled us to keep the roof on our house, enabled us to live here, and we love what we're doing. We love what we're doing, and we meet great people, amazing people come here from, you know, they're running climate change programs, they're uh, working in sustainable companies, they're just ordinary families who want to do something about the bees and saving, you know, biodiversity and feel by paying them money here or staying here that it helps, which it does. So there has to be a greater emphasis on support then no, nobody is looking for handouts for nothing we have to prove that we're working hard to do something for future generations which we're doing and uh, government has to realize that uh, Fort Ireland has to realize that the EU has to realize that and there has to be you know we have to we have we don't want just handouts we want to be doing the work but you know we would like some more grants if you had any money uh, which you probably don't but uh, maybe you can tap into funds to support you know, what you're doing in the Black Stairs here. The Black Stairs is uh, you know, it's a string of pearls and pearls are valuable and pearls are diminishing because you know, they're being fished out of all these little oysters and everything. So a string of pearls is very valuable and in terms of value, the Black Stairs, you couldn't put a price on it for biodiversity from mammals, we have pine martens here too, you know, from mammals, from ornithological species, from the lepidoptera to insects, uh, to the different sedges and things that are growing on the black stairs. That's got to be protected. And we can't have a few cowboys burning out a season and polluting the rivers and the wonderful water coming down, which feeds actually the Carlo town water supply. And uh, so it's, there's got to be a respect, 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 and realize that putting money into environmental schemes is where it has to be. Nobody's expecting handouts for nothing just because you live in the black stairs, but you've got to prove by what you're doing that, you know, a few bob spent wisely would support more people to stay in the area. That's the bulb and the synergy between Wexford and ourselves is very important. You know, so I like that, you know, you know, working with the people on the other side. Absolutely. Um, so just in closing then, um, what does it mean to you to be living and working in this Auckland area? Oh, we would never move. And people say, are you going to downsize? I say, what do you mean to downsize? Because people say, you know, you're, you're getting on, you know, you're, you're going to keep going. I say, of course we are. We're going to keep going because this is what we love doing. We spent our life here, you know, our married life here together. We've known each other over 50 years. We met at college and uh, went our separate ways. Robert went to Australia, I went to South America. Then we came back, met up. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we've put blood, sweat and tears into this place. Absolute blood, sweat and tears. And when you say, was there any interesting things here we moved in? This was a dump. It's now an old rose garden and we've put a, 
a rill we've diverted the stream down the middle of it there and it goes back into the main stream and then fills our little lake and goes over a sluice and goes into mountain river which is the home of the freshwater pearl mussel on the red alert scheme nearly extinct and uh, what we found there was thousands of gin bottles thousands of um blue and green bottles really interesting we kept some of those really interesting artifacts and pill bottles and they love their gin these rectors <laughs> so we dug it all out and we cobbled all that and we made all that and we cobbled all this yard and we planted everything i mean you wouldn't believe um photographs of what this place was like before we came here so we've no intention of moving we'd be carried out in a wicker basket to a green graveyard and we're never moving but it's important to you to maintain and look after this area oh yeah oh absolutely we absolutely love it we spend all our time putting the money back into you know planting trees or um you know making sure we have all the species here we want and um uh, you know f you know we have sheep on the other side of the road and um we don't have any animals on this bit here and you know when farmers have a go at me i said hold on buddy you know i have a herd number i'm like you uh but i'm farming in a sustainable regenerative way very very small amount of sheep and things uh, i'm much more interested in you know plants and uh, growing our vegetables to keep us alive so um we're going nowhere and uh, as people say you you, know, you must downsize never downsize why give in why give in to senior care to hell with it and is there anything else that we haven't discussed that you'd like to add to the record? Well, I'd like to know where you're going with this. We might have a conversation about that. You would need to know, you know, what's going to happen to all this um, um, information and will there be further things next year? And will we, I think we're still a bit, we're not connected really. You know, we've had meetings and things like that, but, you know, I haven't been able to go to some of them. And so I'm missing out a bit of the jigsaw. Um, but it'd be nice to know where this is going or is this just a one-off study and uh, what are you going to do with the information? We can definitely talk about that. Um, but just in terms of um, everything we've talked about, is there anything that, you know, a story that maybe uh, you wanted to tell or anything like that? As part of I, I think, the, the, think the story is, is that a lot of uh, older people have died and a lot of... Um, people moving down from Dublin and various other places restoring all these old houses and things and it would be nice if they kind of bought into the kind of wonderful ethos of the black stairs and just didn't have it as a you know do it up so it appear in the Irish Times say you know we love our home but it's time to move on you know to buy it for four or five years and just sell it on as an investment I'd like them to dig into the kind of beauty of the black stairs and hopefully they can make um, a good income from working at home for whatever they do whether it's uh, working for the one the multinationals or solicitors or whatever they do that they can you know they'll find time to, to get the spirit of the black stairs walk the black stairs get the you know the feeling of the black stairs how old the black stairs is all that if they can you know dig into their community I, th I think that's important there's no point you know doing up a house and commuting out of it and not buying locally. Now around here there's fantastic there are, um, sculptors, felters, potters, wood turners, architects, jewellers, several types of artists. There's the nine stones artist you know I'm, I'm tied in with all these people. I know them all well and they're good friends of mine and they're, they really love the Black Stairs. They've moved here and they're contributing to life here and that's important. We don't want all the old houses, you know, dollied up beautifully with, you know, patios and this kind of stuff uh, and, and just not immerse themselves into the luck they have of actually living in such a special place because it takes time to realise how special it is. If you don't come from uh, a green background and green advisory or an environmental background if you haven't studied um, or you're in tune with nature you can be in tune in nature in a high, high block or duplex apartment and you come here and you say this is fantastic I'm going to you know help my trees and my vegetable garden you know, let them dig themselves into the community so we've got a new you know DNA emerging in the in the Blackstairs who'll appreciate it 
So I, I think that's important that you build the community links. Absolutely. Basically. Well, yeah, well, that's great. Thank you very much for that, Mary. Um, and I will stop the recording now.